Tros Voyja, and welcome to episode 24 of my Soviet Union vlog. Um, this time we're going to be thinking about the fall of the Soviet Union um, and shining a light on the perspective that uh, it maybe was down to Gorbachev's political reforms um, and or um, the role of Boris Yeltsin. I remember that in the Edexcel uh, version of this course, you in this section, you'll be asked about different interpretations. And that means that you need to evaluate um, to what extent one argument about why the Soviet Union fell uh, is more persuasive than another argument. So it's not really saying that these two mesh together, even though they do know, but you're saying actually this one has a bit more credibility than that one, which although right, um, is not quite the full explanation. So last time we talked about the economy and how Gorbachev's economic reforms failed to address the problems or failed to resolve the problems is probably more accurate uh, of the Soviet Union in the mid to late 80s. Um, and uh, alongside that, Gorbachev was also trying to reform, to an extent at least, the um, political nature of the Soviet Union. Remember that under Brezhnev, there had been almost 20 years of um, what drift and um, he saw it as stability, but really um, ossification, that it had become just older and more calcification, I guess, you know, just kind of frozen into, uh, into position. And there was really no debate anymore about um, what should happen, that, that there was no sort of chance of promotion if you were thinking of new and good ideas, because there was real um, too much stability within the system. So Gorbachev has three aims, really, that he spells out, and they are to open up debate within the in, within the party. He needs new ideas and he needs to see a different way forward to allow intellectuals more freedom of expression. Likewise, similar sort of reason. And also to allow the public to have more access to information. Gorbachev, kind of like Khrushchev, was a, a communist that really believed that communism should work for the people. And therefore, he wants the people to be um, informed and to an extent involved so that they see how um, at least how well-meaning things uh, are within the Communist Party and therefore that they'll respond with uh, generosity and enthusiasm for communism on the way forward. So how does he do this? Well, uh, he opens up debate within the party in 1985 by first of all having a purge of senior leaders, uh, removing those kind of old Brezhnevian um, supporters and trying to bring in new guys. Uh, Boris Yeltsin was one of those. We'll come back to him in a bit. In 1986, the 27th Congress um, said they would introduce genuine democracy. Um, and where we say genuine, that's a Soviet definition of genuine, not a Western definition of genuine. Um, nevertheless, in 1987, the Central Committee discussed introducing secret ballots for elections. Um, and that was the point at which <laughs> Yeltsin was sacked in 1987, um, kind of removing some of the debate that was happening within the party. In 1988, uh, the 19th Party Congress introduced multi-candidate elections to the Soviets, not multi-party. There's all still Communist Party vetted members, uh, but multi-candidate elections it is a step forward. And in March of 1989, the first competed election since 1921 took place. In that election, five Central Committee members were defeated. Um, and radicals like Yeltsin did really well. Yeltsin, for instance, won 89 percent of the vote. Uh, in Moscow. So by opening up debate within the party, um, Gorbachev successfully does this, but what he allows is critics of the regime to step forth and uh, to become more popular. He allows intellectuals more freedom of expression. In 1985, writers and intellectuals were invited by Gorbachev to criticise or support reforms and um, to be open about what they thought. And in 1986, a number of books were unbanned, including Dr. Zhivago, uh, which has been critical of uh, Lenin and the um, Civil War era. Uh, and 1984, George Orwell's book, um, as well as poet Anna Akhmatova's work. Akhmatova is A-K-H-M-A-T-O-V-A. In 1988, um, the Soviet press published criticism of Marx and Lenin, um, supported by um, one of Gorbachev's supporters, Alexander Yakovlev, who... Um, played a key role in getting these reforms through. Um, but uh, criticism of Lenin um, and Marx was, was big news, even uh, after the period of destalinization. His third aim was to allow the public to have more access to information. Um, and this happens with the liberalization of the media. In 1985, Alexander Yakovlev, Y-A-K-O-V-L-E-V, -E was responsible for the media. He appointed quite radical editors, but 
there was a reluctance in 1986 to admit to the disaster in Chernobyl and a real slowness there to be open about what happened. Um, by 1988, um, Soviet citizens could listen to foreign radio and read foreign newspapers, so they were getting information from abroad anyway. Um, and 1988, the party did reveal the scale of its economic problems. And so by 1989, over 60,000 informal groups and clubs existed campaigning for reform. So the consequences of these of Glasnost and these political reforms um, were fourfold, I would say, um, and not great for Gorbachev. Of course, they lead to the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, if you were saying that they were the key thing, then these are the sort of things you'd emphasise. So first of all, they divide the party. Um, the failure of the reforms alienated liberals like Yeltsin, but also conservatives like Andrei Gromyko within the party. So they don't they, they're both kind of um, offensive just in reforming to those Stalinist um, people in the past, like Andre Gamiko, who'd been around for, for donkey's years, but also those who want there to be changed, they're not radical enough, they don't move quickly enough or far enough. So that's, that's Gorbachev sort of stuck in the middle and never really sorts things out with either. Um, Gorbachev, uh, Yeltsin rather is a good example, and we'll come back to him um, a bit later on in this, in this vlog. Uh, in 1988, um, a letter was published in Soviet Skya, Russia, when Gorbachev was away, which criticised reforms. And Ligachev, uh, L-I-G-A-C-H-E-V, who was acting leader while Gorbachev was away, used the letter um, attacking criticising reforms to say that the pace of change was the problem. He was in favour of reforms, but the pace of change was the problem. Um, and so in this way, the party kind of subtly undermines what's happening, what Gorbachev is doing. Um, individuals within the party often have really kind of uh, quite nuanced views about reform. There isn't, um, there isn't, uh, Gorbachev doesn't have the ability to impose, um, and maybe not even the political will to impose his ideas thoroughly upon everyone. So the party's divided. It's easy to show that. And the information about uh, the economy also caused citizens to lose faith in the party. That'd be the second thing, flaw, you'd say, in this system. Um, when they, in 1988, at the 19th party conference, the party said, oh, the, the economy is in massive trouble. And um, they talk about the inadequacies in, inadequacies in healthcare and education, to a rural poverty. Um, these things are not necessarily a surprise at a local scale. People understand that there are problems in their area, but they are surprised by how big the problem is. Um, and, and also then the, the, the honesty kind of means that, it, that the government knows about it. Some people think, oh, perhaps, perhaps they don't know that it's so bad here massively shakes the faith of the public in communist rule. This is after, um, what, 60 years um, at least of being told that things are getting better, things are going to improve. And of course, they're not. And that becomes really obvious. And the free media, uh, thirdly, then the free media leads to open criticism of, of Gorbachev and his government. The trouble with giving people free speech is that they use it to attack Gorbachev. And they criticise Stalin. They admit the problems in the Soviet economy. Uh, Repentance was a film that was critical of Stalin's terror, was released, um, bringing up all these kind of old problems of the regime. Uh, in 1988, Alexander Tsipko, T-S-I-P-K-O, criticised Marx and Lenin and the founders of communism um, openly and publicly. And then criticism of Gorbachev begins to grow as well, that reforms too quickly, too slowly, not well enough, it's all falling apart because of him. Um, and that stimulates um, the campaign for um, independence in the republics, which we'll think about next time. Fourthly, then, uh, elections led to organised political opposition. And this is where we link in with Yeltsin. Um, he formed a group um, campaigning for reform and then used that opportunity to uh, to grow his own kind of support base within Russia, which also how it fits in with the nationalities. Um, in March 1990, Gorbachev, under pressure from reformers like Andrei Sakharov, removed Article 6 from the Constitution, which allowed other parties to be formed. Um, and therefore, in 1990, in Leningrad uh, elections, the opposition got 60% of the seat. So, in essence, what Gorbachev does is he opens a door. And um, opening the door, you might argue, doesn't actually do anything other than open the door. But through the door comes opposition um, and uh, criticism. And those things definitely weaken the political integrity of the Soviet Union um, and allow people to express opposition and grow opposition that have been kind of there suppressed before. 
So here, really, I would say it's kind of a slightly chicken and egg um, situation. Does Gorbachev cause that by opening the door to it? Or would you say, look, Gorbachev opens the door, but what happens needs people to actually act. And that's where um, Boris Yeltsin in particular comes in. So I'm running through the Boris Yeltsin um, story. Um, and what we're looking at here are to explain how what Yeltsin's role was in the collapse of the Soviet Union. So Yeltsin uh, was a Communist Party member um, <coughs> and official. He worked in Sverdlovsk. But in 1985, um, Yeltsin, uh, sorry, Yeltsin was summoned to Moscow by Gorbachev. He made him a central, com uh, central committee member and then in December put him in charge of Moscow. Um, and as a result of that, Yeltsin joined the Politburo. But two years later, um, the pace of change was really frustrating to Yeltsin. He wanted to reform further and faster. And he speaks out against um, the, the pace of Perestroika at a central committee meeting. And he's either sacked or resigned. It's not super clear, uh, but basically has a massive falling out um, with Gorbachev. Um, and in February 1988, the following year, um, Gorbachev has him removed from the Politburo. That's phase one of the, of the Yeltsin story. Phase two of the Yeltsin story is about his comeback. And in March 1989, Yeltsin was elected to the Congress of People's Deputies of the Soviet Union uh, with a massive proportion of the vote, um, as we said before, almost 90 percent. He was then elected to the Supreme Soviet of the Soviet Union and in July 1989 announced the formation of a radical um, pro-reform group called the Inter-Regional Group of Deputies. So he gets elected and he starts the campaign. Um, actually, as in fairness, he always has done for further and more radical reform. In 1990, uh, Yeltsin was elected to the Congress of People's Deputies of Russia. So this is not Soviet Union. This is within the Soviet Union, the Russian um, version of it kind of like the Scottish Parliament within the UK. He was then also made chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the Russian um, Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. Um, so he's chairman of the Presidium of Russia, in essence, in spite of the fact that Gorbachev had personally asked the, the Russian deputies not to elect him. That was in March. Three months later, in June 1990, uh, the Congress of Russia declared uh, sovereignty. And the following month, July 1990, Yeltsin resigned from the Communist Party in a dramatic speech at the 28th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union um, to uh, the, you know, the shouts of people um, there who were shouting shame at him. But he resigns from the Communist Party. In June 1991, Yeltsin won 57% of the popular vote in the, in the democratic presidential elections for Russia, not for the Soviet Union, for Russia. Um, defeating Gorbachev's preferred candidate, Nikolai Oritsov, who only got 16% of the vote. So um, Yeltsin becomes president of Russia. And he had been elected president of Russia. I should have mentioned earlier on that Gorbachev um, uh, has the position of president of the Soviet Union created. Um, uh, uh, but he's appointed to it. So he doesn't really have a democratic right to that position, whereas Yeltsin has been elected by the people to be president of Russia. In Yeltsin's presidential election campaign, he criticises the dictatorship of the centre, but doesn't suggest that he'll introduce a full scale market economy. Um, he's just kind of against increased prices. And um, then the third sort of phase is that uh, in August of 1991, there's a coup against Gorbachev. So by this time, the people who were resisting any change, the old school Stalinists, were so worried about what Gorbachev was up to that they launched a coup against um, him to stop Perestroika and to stop Glasnost. Gorbachev was held in Crimea under house arrest. Yeltsin is in Moscow. He uh, legs it to the White House of Russia, which is the Russian parliament building, um, and uh, climbs on top of a tank there. The tanks have been sent to shut down the White House, but they um, they don't obey orders. He climbs on top of it, makes an, a, a speech. And he's kind of there physically at the centre of all resisting change. The troops defect in the face of public opposition. Um, and uh, the leaders of the coup flee Moscow and Gorbachev is brought back from Crimea. Hooray, Gorbachev is freed. But this is a turning point in power and authority within the Soviet Union. Yeltsin is hailed as like this, the defender of democracy. Um, and Gorbachev is restored to his position, but he's politically massively weakened um, by this. And there are sort of famous examples of Yeltsin um, putting him down in public. On the 6th of November 1991, 
Uh, so later that year, Yeltsin issued a decree banning all Communist Party activities on Russian soil. And then two days later, on the 8th of December 1991, he met with the Ukrainian president and the uh, leader of Belarus um, and signed uh, accords, which we might talk about next time, actually, um, declaring the independence of those three countries, um, dissolving the Soviet Union um, and replacing it with the Commonwealth of Independent States. Um, kind of loosely gathered together. According to Gorbachev, Yeltsin kept this plan secret um, and his main goal in dissolving the Soviet Union was to get rid of Gorbachev. Gorbachev takes it very personally. There's no doubt that these two men have fallen out massively um, and uh, are in conflict through the 80s. However, Yeltsin was always a reformist. Um, he just went further and further and further and became kind of... Um, free marketeer, really, and, and a Democrat in a way that Gorbachev couldn't stomach or support. Uh, on the 17th of December, Yeltsin met with Gorbachev. Gorbachev accepts the fait accompli, agrees to dissolve the Soviet Union, and that happens on the on Christmas Day, on the 25th of December, when, uh, 1991, when the Soviet Union ceased to exist. So, um, whereas he said earlier on that Gorbachev opens this door by allowing there to be more debate within the party and by allowing there to be more freedom of speech, it is Yeltsin in particular who moves through that door um, in criticising and in rallying support and actively promoting and seeking to promote um, change within the Soviet Union and eventually bringing down the Soviet Union with that agreement with the Ukrainian Belarusian um, leaders. I hope that's helpful. Next time, uh, we're going to think about the nationalism, the rising nationalism within the Soviet Union in this period. And that overlaps with what we talked about with the arts in today. And we'll kind of wrap up the whole thing about the fall of the Soviet Union. See you then.